Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Anto Budiarjo. Welcome to Monday Live. This is something that we do uh, every Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Eastern, yes, that's right. Uh, to figure out the future of uh, smart buildings. Um, so uh, great to have you all here. A uh, reminder, the list of um, who we are, panelists, are, is, is, uh, is on mondaylive.org. Uh, um, also a reminder that um, conversations here, the views uh, expressed are personal, not uh, of any company or organization. Um, and uh, we do uh, want to have a, as much of our conversations as, as we can, especially today on the chat, and I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, so please um, uh, participate in that. Um, this slide deck um, and thus any links on it is uh, also on the mondaylive.org homepage if you need any of the links that we talk about. Um, the general theme of this month is uh, reconfiguring the BAS industry after uh, nearly two years. Um, we've learned a lot and we've talked about a lot. So we've been talking about uh, what we anticipate the, uh, to happen that needs to happen in, in, the, in the BAS industry to to form itself into um, something hopefully uh, better and uh, more productive. Um, and But today our, our agenda is a little different. So uh, we're gonna have a normal chit chat on news and trends and our, our guests um, is uh, basically you guys, uh, the uh, uh, attendees of, of uh, this, um, uh, this webinar. Um, so uh, it, it, we, we realized uh, on, on our planning call last week that um, April being next month is, um, will be two years since we started Monday Live. We started in April of uh, 2020. So it'll be sort of our birth month uh, next month. So as we wrap up, we really want to get your thoughts as to um, you know, why you keep on coming back and listening to um, this, this group of people talking about uh, all this stuff. And also um, the, the question that we've been asking ourselves in the last couple of weeks is what, what one thing or what, what do you anticipate needing to change or um, uh, going to change in the, in the industry um, to sort of uh, um, uh, increase and sort of improve the industry. So we really want to have a conversation with you. Um, if you are interested in um, participating in this, please just chime in on chat. And um, we'll collectively uh, try and keep track of that. And we'll bring you on uh, for a, a few minutes um, for you to say what you need to say. And then we'll rotate it to the next um, attendee. So uh, let's uh, do that. So uh, David Katz is the first one uh, to uh, uh, volunteer. So I'll, I'll bring you on uh, later once we start this, this section. Uh, so before, before all that, um, Ken, what's going on in your world? Thank you very much, Anto. Uh, of course, we've got our uh, March issue up, which is the women's issue, women creating amazing opportunities. Uh, we're hard at uh, trying to get our April issue uh, finished. We're waiting for a few articles, kind of beat up some people. Uh, reinvention, reconfiguration, and forced evolution is our theme. And our industry, like all other industries, are immersed in immense change. And the communication of that change is the greatest importance and fundamental to our forced evolution. And we all need to be part of that communication. And automated buildings has always tried to do that. And I think we're, we're, we're trying to reinvent ourselves and do some reconfiguration so we can have a little bigger reach. And uh, we're in the, middle of, uh, in the middle of eating our own words. Uh, James Dice is... Uh, one of his uh, events kind of caught my attention. Uh, he dives into the Mesa uh, Smart Building Kit. Uh, it was part of Sidewalk, part of Google. Uh, kind of interesting to see these folks coming into the industry. There's a link there to the Mesa site. Kind of looks a little bit like uh, comfy on steroids, uh, but uh, interesting to see where that's gonna go. Uh, if you take a look at uh, uh, the, our, the sneak preview of our April new products, you'll start to see that there's a whole bunch of new approaches. And again, this goes back that uh, all of our job is communication to kind of push these ideas around. I think even the ideas that we, we all think are maybe not going to go are still important 
because they're getting funded and they're getting press and they're causing uh, uh, fuzz on the radar screen. So we need to help, help to help. We need to help provide clarity to that. And of course, uh, the smarter stack is probably a good uh, vehicle for doing that. Uh, another article that is on our uh, April issue written by um, Mark is the uh, environmental, social and governance. So these three words uh, are really changing our industry. Back to you. I like your content, um, Ken. I looked at that Mesa smart building kit. Yes, it's comfy on steroids. I like that, uh, like that take. Um, nice kit though, nice, nice equipment they make. Uh, moving on to John. Hi. Yeah, a couple of uh, um, things I noticed, wanted to share this week. Um, we've talked about it. We've talked about ESG. Mark had an article on, on ESG and automated buildings, and we've talked about how that can, can be a positive force driving for more sustainable buildings. Now, the SEC has proposals uh, about reporting. Uh, we've talked about many organizations, public organizations are voluntarily reporting in that way, but they're looking at standard, standardized reporting that will be required potentially of um, public companies. I think it's just interesting that that seems to be coming on. Um, you know, we've talked about the forces that can help for intelligent, sustainable, more efficient buildings. And I think on a number of occasions we've talked about regulation is part of that whole um, market effort. It won't do it alone, but it won't, I don't think we'll ever get there without it. And so I thought that was interesting because, again, it comes out of the financial side of the world as opposed to ASHRAE or AEE or all of those uh, nerdy things we work with on a regular basis. So um, on uh, also, um, you know, as we see numerous organizations are really uh, showing what can be accomplished. And so there's an article here about targets for us net zero energy store. Um, thought that was pretty interesting. And, uh, you know, also, I guess, you know, it doesn't seem that that far a leap. Obviously, they had a plan for it. And I'm sure they had different capital expenses than a regular store. But this is all doable, right? What's required is the financial models, and the will to some degree. So I thought those were interesting stories I wanted to share. Uh, two other quick points. One, um, we uh, at uh, Haystack, there will be a, a virtual Haystack uh, Connect event for 2022. Uh, the dates were changed to the fall. It's gonna to be too early to do it in May. Uh, some mailings have gone out and the website will be updated. I just put it in the chat for everyone out there. September 13th through 15th, 2022 will be uh, the dates for a virtual year. And we're doing that because of the momentum uh, activity. Uh, now, the other thing I've seen positive indication is um, very active conversations of collaboration between a number of the uh, different ontology tagging or however you wanted to metadata standards out there in the world. There's been a, a very positive, I'd say, round of communication on collaboration over the last uh, 60, 75 days. So that's what I have. Great. Thank you. And as a reminder to the... Uh, audience here our guest uh, today is you so uh, if you want to um, come and join the panel for a few minutes and talk about um, uh, why you keep on coming back to uh, Monday Live and also your anticipation of the, the, the industry's future as we have done the last couple of couple of weeks just with us so please um, say something on the chat if you uh, want to do this so next up on the slides is uh, Roger yeah, just a couple of things I noticed was that uh, there was a an article on um, the investments going on in prop tech, and they're suggesting now that you know with a kind of decline in in people investing in startups, um, that you know we're going to see a lot more you know mergers and acquisitions in the industry, uh, which probably makes sense because I think it's saying that seventy three percent of startup founders said it's getting harder to raise capital and, and things like that, which was accelerated last year. So you might see them reaching out to get uh, perhaps, you know, either bought or merging with other companies. And it's kind of saying that, you know, they expect real estate type companies to be aggressive in their tech innovation and, and startup and the m &A activity. So it's quite important to us because I think billions has been 
been uh, invested. A lot of that are in cloud applications and startups at that end, but it does reach across the whole industry and that should have an effect. Uh, the other thing I saw was uh, interesting to see that uh, in New York, how much Apple, Amazon, Google, and uh, Facebook have actually taken up on the uh, on uh, the uh, New York there, you know, sort of north of Mulholland Tunnel there. They've taken up a lot of space. Interesting that the only one missing is Microsoft. Perhaps they'll follow up like they always do later on. But it should be interesting to see because if these guys take over buildings, they obviously get quite innovative with some of the stuff they want in it and how they run it. So it'll be easy to... Uh, be interesting to see, you know, what happens in that space and what they'll they'll start looking at with technical innovation in their buildings. But uh, quite a lot of activity there, obviously uh, coming across there to the the west side of uh, New York. Great, thank you, um, Anno. Yeah, um, something interesting. I think I was actually triggered from an email that I got from Tom Shirkley from uh, IB. Not that I'm promoting any any particular approach or solution or anything. Um, but if you haven't been aware, there's a significant uptick in um, cybersecurity issues that they feel are coming from the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And and um, Tom uh, was... Um, basically talking about some of the stuff that they've been catching just lately. So I think just a, probably a good uh, moment for awareness, you know, if, especially if you're doing any remote management, remote capabilities, I'm sure uh, um, Bill, our incumbent cyber guy on that panel, and I'll have a lot to talk about this, uh, but I think it's actually quite important to just raise um, that there's, there's a significant uptick in cyber um, as a result of the, of the conflict going on. So eyes open. Okay, thank you. Um, next up. Um... Can, I, can I make a comment to that? Because I uh, nice. set it up for me. Um, we've got systems integrators who the FBI has gone into their offices and basically pulled them out and said, we need you on these calls where all 12 offices have been on calls to talk about cybersecurity for critical infrastructure, even the build space and these, the FBI has told them this hasn't happened since 9/11. Mm. So that's the uh, that's the rel that's the importance that's the context for what's going on now with what you mentioned now. Yeah, I think awareness right now, right, Bill? Just yep, yep. You know, we keep it's so interesting. We've all talked about it's been a thing for 20 years, but. Well, maybe the next thing, the colonial pipeline, the target, none of that ever seems to like, so maybe this is the final thing that actually says, yeah. okay, you pay attention to security. It's important, yeah. Yeah. Uh, next up, um, Tracy, I've just seen this and it's very sad. It is. Oh. Apologize for the last minute editing there, Anto, but... I felt it was important to, to let everyone know about this, but Barry Hausa passed away over the weekend. Wow. Mm. I know most of you here on the call certainly knew Barry from his Lawnmark and or Echelon years. Um, he'd been fighting Parkinson's for quite some time, actually, and finally succumbed to it over the weekend. So wow. I hate to That's bring sad. mood down, but uh, Barry really was an important part of our industry. Part of what didn't make this yet, but will come out when I think when Lawnmark publishes this, um, just how important he was to the Lawnmark organization. He was the executive director in charge um, that took it out of Echelon as kind of an Echelon owned entity to create Lawnmark International as a standalone nonprofit organization. <clears throat> He's also the was the driving force behind uniting all of the lawn user uh, groups from all over the world into one organization with one, one voice. Um, that is kind of the Lawnmark International that we know today. So a lot of great work for the industry, kind yeah. of behind the scenes a lot. He was involved with lots of other organizations in our industry as well, as you can see in the list there. You know, I knew him mostly from the Lawnmark uh, experience but uh, he really kind of touched a lot of different aspects of our industry. Well, we went into him um, 
when we launched Haystack for guidance and consulting to help us uh, accelerate the launch of that as a 501c. Great guy. That's that's yeah. terrible news. Yeah. It's really, really smart when it comes to marketing. He was, uh, just a little side note, um, when he first started at Echelon, one of the very first things that he did was to write the launch plan and marketing plan for the original lawn uh, builder, which was the development tool for LawnWorks developers way back in when it first came out in the early 90s. So, yeah, he was indeed a great guy. He, we had an opportunity to work with each other for several years. It's uh, really, really sad to hear this, but. Yeah. Thank Same you, Tracy. Time. So on, on my side, I saw these two, um, uh, 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 quite a long article as they all are on uh, economists in terms of uh, the, the impact on the uh, very sad war that we're seeing in, in Ukraine and what's going on with Russia and especially with the uh, oil and gas. and. Um, and um, this being a potentially, the, the argument of this article is that this being a potentially a, another sort of big trigger to drive clean energy um, products and solutions. Uh, so I thought it's interesting people are starting to think about it in, in that uh, manner. Um, it's unfortunately it's behind the economist paywall, but um, it, it's a very interesting uh, article. Um, the other, the other um, piece that I saw, it's kind of a little bit um, futuristic, if you think about it, um, but um, the, the, the creation of this sort of city, a potential city or a, a plan or an idea of a city um, uh, it called uh, a metaverse city, which actually doesn't make sense because it's actually a physical city. So I don't really know, but it's the, trying to sort of meld the two. Um, as we, you know, we do talk about the, the, the future of um, buildings and the future of how buildings are being used. So this is kind of interesting. And the, the, the critical thing about no rules of police is that one of the critical things they, they say is that keep, if, you, if you have the city that's actually orderly and clean, it actually uh, diminishes the, the need for um, rules and police. Now, I'm not sure I would totally subscribe to that, uh, but it's an interesting kind of uh, thing to, uh, to to think about. No. So, you know, uh, I, uh, I got one real quick one, just to, uh, I didn't send it in. So uh, these last five days, six days, I've been in Florida business and I needed a break. And so um, I was in Destin and I'm driving by a well-known fast food restaurant. And something caught my eye. I stopped and I think we started talking about this last week, maybe about EV charging stations becoming popular and being installed in the built environment, whether it be retail, commercial building, whatever. And lo and behold, there were 10 charging stations at this well-known fast food restaurant. So. I was not driving an electrical vehicle. I anyway, went in there and I said, how do you guys use these? They say, well, every time a customer comes in, they give them a coupon that gives them access to the EV stations as part of the experience. No cost to them. It, all they're doing is buying food. But it's interesting how the customer experience now is taking the EV stations to heart. So, uh, and I asked, well, whose idea was this? They said, well, it came from corporate, but we're the first franchise and they've got, I don't know, maybe a hundred of these uh, uh, locations, a mixed bag, uh, and they're gonna, they're gonna do it in every one of them. So I thought that was interesting. Mm. <clears throat> I, haven't, I haven't seen the coupon thing, Mark, but, um... You know, a lot of the Tesla charging stations are either in the parking lot directly of fast food places or right, right next door. Right. Um, it's interesting um, that they're embracing it in a positive way that way, because sometimes I think the owners of the restaurants, or at least the managers, maybe not the owners, but the managers, 
aren't as happy about having those chargers there and people coming in because the number one use is the restroom, not necessarily mm -hmm. buying food. <laughs> so it's good that they're encouraging them to actually um, shop and, and purchase something. So mm -hmm. I find that kind of interesting, Mark. It's fascinating that they're doing this. And I wonder if they're not, I mean, they're clearly ahead of their time. My question is, if you're driving a Tesla, and I just drove one through all last two weeks in LA. Am I eating at a fast food joint? I don't think there's a connection there. Mm -hmm. You'd be uh, you know what? <laughs> Maybe what we look. find ourselves doing is getting a drink usually, right? So I'm a, I'm a fir firm believer that we need to try to encourage this sort of adoption and behavior. So when we stop somewhere, we'll go in and buy uh, a, a a drink, a lemonade, a soda, something, or, you know, a dessert or whatever. We try to stay away from the fast food as far as an actual meal, but, but we try to, we try to, you know, give them something to encourage them to continue to support this effort, whether it's Tesla or others, it doesn't matter to me. And Scott, Scott made a, uh, an interesting comment, not Tesla's, but, you know, e Chevy's pickup trucks. There's obviously, yeah. The world of electric vehicles is yeah. growing unbelievably. It's a good yeah. point. Scott makes a good so point. Good, That's good really point, Scott. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of lower, low cost kind of the entry level EVs that are coming out here in the next 18 months or so, um, along with pickup trucks. And, you know, Rivian is out, the Ford F-150 is coming out, GMC is coming out with their pickups. So, of course, if you can afford a GMC pickup, you probably aren't eating fast food either. Oh, that you are so completely wrong. Contracting, <laughs> contractors, contractors. On the move in, be, in between jobs. Oh, yeah. got to grab that burger or that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, they're oh, they're driving yeah. they're driving the um, uh, it's it's GMC built, but it's the um, uh, why am I blanking on the brand? Hummer? Hummer. You know Hummer. I, I had you know Hummer. It. Yeah. So it's yeah. you know it's a hundred and twenty hundred and thirty thousand dollar pickup truck. Yeah. yeah. So well, somebody said you've got three of them on order for your driveway. So yeah, I, I wish. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, 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 I did see an article. I didn't. I didn't actually link it here. Um, that Volkswagen is is uh, starting to think of planning their uh, charging stations in the U.S. And I, I saw one write up about them wanting to do it almost like an indoor thing, where there's you drive in and there's a concierge and there's lounge and so people are trying different things. Yeah, so, so Volt, Volkswagen's behind one of the biggest uh, networks in the, in the country. Yeah. Okay, Electrify America, that was right. uh, caused by the diesel gate, and they, <laughs> they were required to contribute $2 billion to build out an EV charging network. That's a for-profit business. Um, so that's Electrify America, and that is owned by, oh, the major shareholder has been, I don't know if it's changed, but that's um, Volkswagen. Um, they've been, most of their stations are located at Walmarts and Targets in the back corner of the uh, parking lot. Mm -hmm. And that's how we, uh, when we, when we drive the electric vehicle long distance, that's the primary place we stop. You know, it seems to work there because you're going to take 25 minutes typically for a, a sizable charge. Um, and so, you know, go in and do your shopping or if you're heading down vacation, okay, we'll wait till we get closer before we, you know, fill the car with the food and whatever. So we found the, those to be uh, very practical. The issue with stopping at fast food is what type of chargers? Are they fast charge? Because if they're not fast charge, it's a um, borderline meaningless gimmick. Okay, because the amount of, amount of charge you can get off a slow charger in 15 to 25 minutes is virtually zero. So, yeah. you know, it's so funny that you bring that up, John. Um, about five years ago, one of the soccer dads on my grandson's team is the Southwest Regional Sales Manager for Volkswagen. So he's got California, Arizona, okay. Nevada. And he had just returned from a meeting in Germany where they, kind of laid out the next 10 years for Volkswagen and it was all electric vehicles, oh, even yeah. five years ago. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to prepare um, dealerships in particular for this because anyone who has worked around the, the auto industry knows that dealers 
typically stay alive because of the maintenance involved with the cars, not selling the cars so much, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And that that changes that that whole completely. game. That revenue yeah. Chain. yeah. Mm -hmm. Completely. So. All right. so can I, can I, so John said it really great when he said that, um, you know, and, and that people, you know, it allows people to come in and shop around. I'm so sorry. Then, it's very hard to hear you, Gina. I've got another speaker. All right, I'll just type it. <laughs> okay. Type it, yeah. All right, thanks. Um, the uh, Div 2525 is still um, uh, continuing that work on Tuesdays. Um, again, if you're interested in being part of that, just uh, post a chat on, on, uh, on the chat. Um, other thoughts? I think we've covered that. Let's get the audience in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so just one, one, one thing. Uh, in April, we're going to be talking about value. Uh, so just sort of uh, prepping up for next month. Um, so that's the, the general team theme on that. But uh, for this month and for today, reconfiguring BAS, uh, I'm going to bring in uh, David Katz, who has volunteered to come and join us. Um, and please, uh, if you do want to come and join us um, on stage here, please just um, say something on the chat in, to that effect, and I'll bring you on. Um, David so Katz. Stop you sharing your screen also, Anton. I'm sorry? Stop sharing your screen. Oh, yes. Thank you. So, um, David, um, welcome to the, to the panel. I'm going to unmute. Um, I'm going to un. Yeah. So it's just two 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 questions really. One one is um, what have you you know why do you keep on coming to Monday Live? Well, obviously there's something going on here, and and also what's the what your thoughts are in terms of the future and the kind of the discussions we were having the last couple of weeks in terms of the one thing that you like to see. So over to you. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna work backwards just so I'd like to be added to the twenty five twenty five, and I'll tell you why the. They, so first, I've been doing this for 30 years. I, I bought the first ILONG 100 and was using, you know, BASs with the Windows so one. Uh, but I also helped set up CABA 20, 30 years ago. And so, and I know many of you from many of the meetings that we've had. And, um, you know, when I, I see this smart building effort, I've taken uh, Nexus's course. Um, and as I said, we developed a building intelligence quotient or rating system that competes with Spire and Smart Score and Wire Score. And uh, we're looking to educate people on what a smart building is. But I just spent two hours with the Canadian municipalities on deep retrofits, and it's not about controls, it's about the building envelope. And that's how we're going to get, I mean, the net zero store that John showed without having that insulation and that low load, they wouldn't have enough PV on the roof. So I learned much from your discussions, obviously. I look forward to anybody wanting to try out our building intelligence quotient, which Anto helped, Anto helped us per, you know, develop uh, 12 years ago, I think the first version. And uh, this, both Bixi and the Division 25 were used to develop the questions in this benchmarking of the smart building, similar to Spire and similar to uh, Smart School. So I welcome uh, connecting and and also I'm starting a BIG group, the you know building intelligence group with the uh, with you know 20 cities we had on a call on Tuesday or 12 cities including people from Schneider and Honeywell and big companies, as well as the small uh, engineering firms. And I think we have to lower the silos. I think you guys speak about that all the time. So I welcome that. Thanks. Yeah. So you, you're, you're creating a, a big chapter in, in Canada or? In the GTA, in the greater Toronto area. Okay, great, sorry. And, and you know, we have the biggest companies here with Quadreal and BIM and Dream and some of the biggest real estate people like Oxford who are into this big time. I mean, they're on the Realcom and Smart and the IBCon uh, things all the time. And I, you know, obviously I, I watch Jim Young and his efforts because we need to know what the customers need. As Ken knows many times, we have to ask the customer. Mm. 
Do you okay. have a link, um, David, for the intelligent quotient that you could share in the chat? Building-iq.com. It brings up the website with the the old uh, CABA announcement, but the new registration will come to me and I will set up a value, a, a free demo for any building that you want to test. The input has come, I'll have to be candid, from the China Academy of Building Research who reached out to us in Canada when they were doing their smart building evaluation standard. And then we, uh, working with ASHRAE and all our guidelines here and Lich Schneider and Division 25 and Vixie, we developed the questionnaire to the North American market. And we know what Spire is doing and we know what Wirescore are doing and it's very, very similar at lower cost. Cool. So David, I, yeah, go ahead. quick question. What, what kind of information are you looking at or what kind of data are you collecting? It's a, it's a benchmarking questionnaire, yes or no. Do you have this? We cover all areas. We initially, it was built on the, the green globes uh, for existing buildings. And so many of the questionnaires were about calibration and sensors and documentation. But when we were making it the smart building, then we went into all the issues about data and, and cybersecurity and healthy buildings and electronic lockers for food. And, and already two years, it's out of date in light of the hybrid experience. We started writing this before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And now when we see the applications that are coming in some of the webinars that I'm just on now, it's all about indoor air quality and are people gonna return to work? And uh, as you had the JLL guy saying, we're buying you know, software companies on the uh, occupant experience. What about um, cybersecurity? Is that in anything right now? Well, Certainly we have, question, we have questions on that, but not as deep as you know, uh, Tom Shirkwood might recommend. So we're just raising and educating people on what may be in a smart building. And then we have an IB tool, a, a design specification program working with the UK. Uh, Chris Thorne, who was interviewed by Ken Sinclair a while back, he developed a model, IB, how to develop rate and specifications for your smart building, which is different than other people's smart buildings. So one is, what do you have now? And then what are you going to design new smart features for your building? Happy to show both of the programs. Any other questions for David? Hey, David, I have a, a question. Um, I just got off the phone with a commissioning group. I'm speaking at this commissioning group tomorrow. And someone just said the latest and greatest thing is envelope commissioning, okay? I've never heard of it, uh, uh, and you just mentioned it again. Because so, what is that envelope you're referring to? Educate me. Bill, the biggest challenge is the envelope. I, I have here a, a product called Magnetite from the U.S. that's been around for 30 years. 25 to 30 percent of the energy lost from the HVAC is going through your windows, and and you know we're trying to resize things. We, we're trying to go and put in a new chiller, a new boiler, and higher COP, and and yet. We have dump controls and the building envelope, they're even talking in deep retrofits in from Europe to literally put new siding on the existing building so that the loads are down. Got it. We also now have drones that can literally fly around the existing building and with thermography show all the terrible places that the energy is leaking out. So, you know, we're 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 doing controls on equipment but we should really lower the loads and take a holistic approach. Got that, thank you. Yeah, I agree. Uh, actually, the, the windows that are behind me are all triple glazed and have been for 30 years. This is a passive solar home. That's uh, exactly, exactly what- Once you do that calculation, like the civil biggest thing was the glass. Yes, the civil people never talked to the mechanical people who never talked to the instrumentation people. So even your division 25 shows, or 2525 shows how we have to integrate these overlapping, uh, you know, engineering silos. Okay. And I you. think we've thank got you. some, Anto, we got some more folks. Steve. Yeah, I know. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, David. And uh, Steve, um, you are now on the panel. Uh, okay, great. And, um, all yours. All righty. Well, I think most of you have 
interact with me or at least know what we do. Um, our life has been focused on legacy BAS systems, uh, integrating into them and helping the integration community to transition those buildings to new technology. Um, very early on, we made a strategic decision that we were not going to um, delve into analytics or uh, operator workstations or really anything that you would consider the operations area because those uh, those things would step on the same toes we were trying to work with. And that has turned out to be a very good approach. Many times I just simply explain what we do uh, as enabling technology. And it doesn't matter, you know, it's all about data. Um, you know, we make the data available from these legacy buildings and what the integrator does with it is really up to them. So um, the, the one thing that we've been struggling with, and I'd, I'd like to get any ideas this panel has, is you know, how do we educate all the building owners that exist out there and their, and their trusted advisors? Uh, up until you know, the pandemic hit, our strategy has always been work through the BAS manufacturers uh, or the application manufacturers and, and so forth. And you know what I'm finding out is we're probably been missing a lot of opportunities um, simply because, especially the BAS manufacturers would rather rip everything out and replace it. And so the building owner typically never hears about the option to uh, do an integration and transition their building over time. So I'd just like to hear any ideas or suggestions that this panel might have. And why I keep coming back? Well, just simply need to keep up to, up to date on what's happening in the industry. Even though our focus is on the legacy systems, um, our, cust our, our customers and our partners are out there on the leading edge in a lot of cases. Mm. So I'm open to comments. I like the... Um... Steve, this is Anna. Um, yeah, the, 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 not an option to rip and replace. And I think one of the messages that we, one of the things that we keep running into, and I'm sure you've challenged too, is, you know, oftentimes we get uh, new startup IoT type companies coming in saying they've got, you know, the latest and greatest solution, uh, which is required, which requires you not to rip and replace, you know, what you've already got there and, and quote unquote compliments. Uh, how do you see the, um, the impact of IoT guys and what you're doing? Uh, I see I see them as an inter interesting lot of people out there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's an organization called uh, IOXC, I believe, is looking at cybersecurity in the I IoT marketplace, and I've been I've been sitting in on that group. Um, I think they are pretty much aware that uh, I, IoT um, cannot do the, the building automation job on its own because of all the risks that you have with um, the internet connection and not being 100% rely, reliable and so forth. So I think in some circles, uh, they're becoming more realistic in, in that, uh, Local control is still required. And in most cases that translates to some backnet solution. Um, and the real value that they're offering is the cloud-based applications that you know, they, can, they can do things in the, in the cloud, like look at a whole portfolio of, of properties um, ra rather than just one building. So I think they are starting to evolve into something that is complementary to the things that we've been doing for a long time, um, but it is going to take some, some time. Um, just a, a, an additional comment. One of the things I've been working on uh, is trying to work with people who put out guide specs. And, um, you know, because they're, I mean, they're the people that the building owners are going to go to and say, I need to upgrade my building, help me, help me to put together an RFP. And so uh, we're, what we're trying to do is um, 
morph those guide specs away from being just, here's the new stuff I want to give me two options. Give me the option of, of replacing my entire building in one fell swoop with the rip and replace, but also give me the option of um, you know, being able to do an integration and transition over time. And we're hoping that those things come out as you know, mandatory. In other, in other words, they can't just say, well, I'm not gonna bid on the, on the uh, uh, integrate and transition. If you wanna bid on this project, give me both options. Let me as a building owner decide what's best for my business. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I just posted, uh, uh, Steve filled out uh, his his company on a on the smart stack. And so he's been a big supporter of Monday Live. He gets it and he's using it. I think it's a great example of how uh, all of us, all our companies need to depict themselves and would help tremendously with our, our communication problem. Yeah, I agree. It makes it really clear. Where, where does this technology fit? What does it solve in the stack? Really, I, I saw that too and thought that was a great example. So, yep. uh, so Steve, your, your initial uh, concern was getting, at, I think, getting building owners to understand that what's, what's possible. Uh, with regard to integrate to, to uh, getting data out of their legacy systems. Yes. Was that, that correct? So yes. they're really, I think, as a problem for our industry, we don't have a, a one place to go with questions and answers for, to, you know, anything building control related. Um, what I what I'm aware of, at least the way I think of our industry is, is, is fragmented. Uh, there, if you're a if you're the university educational system, you got APA. If you're a hospital, is your ASHE. Uh, yes, yes. Put ASHRAE aside for a minute, but because I don't think they're they're necessarily trying to solve the, the problem. I'm just stating here, but but I think by verticals is where facilities engineers go to hear and learn about what's going on. But it's always relative to their world. Um, is Steve? Is that your perception that it, that facility engineers don't? There isn't this place that any facility engineer, irrespective of the kind of building they have, can go to get answers. That's my impression, absolutely. So I, I mentioned that we were, you know, trying to work with guide specs and so forth. Yeah. Um, Backnet Backnet International is uh, using a DoD guide spec as a, as a starting point, mm -hmm. and they are they're going to put together a guide spec that is manufacturer neutral. Um, so I've been working with them uh, to uh, try to formulate that guide spec in the way I just, just described. Um, and I, I know that the automated logic has a guide spec. And of course, they also have some integration technology of their own. So I'm working with them to um, make sure that when their, their guide spec comes out, it uh, it's not got to call out the S4 product. I don't wouldn't expect it to as a as a neutral guide spec, but um, it, it will you know add add credibility to the fact that the integration and long term transition strategy is a valid option. Right. And or you're muted. So I'm. Moving my lips for that. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Steve. <laughs> um, and I brought on um, Scott Simpson, uh, who indicated he wants to uh, talk to us. So, Scott, please uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you're looking forward to and why you're here. Oh, thank you. My name is uh, Scott Simpson from uh, Portland, Oregon, here at PAE uh, Consulting Engineers. Um, we just built the world's largest commercial living building here in Portland. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate uh, the comment before about the envelope and the importance there. Um, this building um, here has a lot of um, passive heating and cooling. Um, we have actuators on the windows that open and um, precipitate airflow. We did a number of things. Um, and I think that pa that passive thinking we need to think of in addition to um, the technology as well. One of the things we did that, that really brought down costs and um, power consumption was 
we actually um, situated our MDF and um, all of our servers and um, right across from our heat pumps and the heat um, heat pumps are drawing air, drawing the warm air from the MDF while blowing cool air back onto the racks and it creates a symbiotic relationship. We did a lot of just strategic planning on just passively how this thing works next to this thing. And I think the more more than just technology that's a big part of it but i do appreciate i do want to did want to say that your work here has has we're already using the smarter stack on projects we're already it's been a huge help to us and and in just the last few months the amount of projects that we're consulting on in this in, in um on smart buildings particularly clients who want cloud in integration and in and utilize MQTT has been, it's exploded. And I think that uh, a lot of it's, uh, you know, the fact that you came together during this pandemic and helped move this along, I really do appreciate it. So Scott, Thanks. Mark Peacock, I have, a, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So as you were designing this building and obviously others, taking into account the envelope, as we've been discussing, where did the drive come from? Was it the building owner saying to you, hey, this is, we're interested in the building envelope as well as this, or was this you and your firm bringing this up? How did this, well, this, this one's happen? easy. Oh, this one was easy because we're actually the part owners. Uh, okay. We're owners with this building with ZGF Architects and uh, a few other developers. Um, but um, we also worked on the Bullet Center in Seattle, another mm -hmm. living building, um, and we we learned a lot from that and incorporating it into this new um, new building. It's all CLT construction. Um, it's uh, but but the the envelope uh, we we had a lot being that we're um, this is the first market case um, for a living building for building this way. And so we wanted to actually show a return on investment. And uh, so we actually sat down and said, can we make this work? Um, can, we, can we actually um, actually spend an extra 10 million on, the, on this project and reap a benefit? And we figured out we could. And not just, uh, not just the most tangible things, but we're making a revenue off the compost <laughs> and our composters. We're making revenue. Um, we also have a uh, return on investment in, um, this is a great um, tool for finding new talent. A lot of people are interested in working with us now and, uh, and we're, our costs on recruiting have gone down. Um, so there's, there's a lot of benefits to building this way, not just the obvious. Good, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, the, the intersection between information technology and envelope and more passive kind of technology has always sort of intrigued me that I'm not quite sure how to connect them. But I think I think you did say something important, though, Anto, um, in that just getting these entities to talk to each other. Um, one of the things I love here at PAE um, is that we, we, we do have a lot more interdisciplinary coordination than a lot of firms but um but still even with that no, we do not talk to each other enough and i think that all of these different disciplines need to and you know master systems integrators have a huge you know a huge play a huge part in that but also firms like us in the early part of uh, the project in in bim and actually getting that coordination to happen even with the civil engineers even with everyone and having that vision understood by everyone involved. Yeah, it's, it starts there. Any other comments or thoughts from the group? Yeah, Scott, you mentioned uh, that you're getting a lot of requests for MQTT. Uh, what data definitions are people asking for? As MQTT is just a low level protocol for communicating. What kinds of uh, metadata and uh, data definitions are people asking for with that MQTT? Well, we're still um, mostly everybody is still um, adhering to Project Haystack. We do have some people using Google, Google's ontology, and uh, and but mainly um, the big problem now is a lot of clients do not like to be stuck in um, this 
proprietary cloud application or that proprietary cloud mm -hmm. environment and they want everything to go to a data lake to then pick and choose what analytics and what uh, and what application they want to use and um, and so keeping things agnostic is kind of the key but um, but they are sticking to um, you know um, project haystack or standards gen, yeah. standard da data yeah. Or, or we have to, um, or we have to tell them that that's that it needs to be standard, or else this is going to be a big mess. I just on that point, Scott, are you finding the people that you're talking to are they are you still finding that they are surprised that those standards exist, or uh, or not so much? No, actually, there it's amazing how many people are in the building industry, in building systems, in building controls that still have no idea this exists right. it really is astonishing and uh, i think we just have a lot of educating we have to continue to do but um and and even among even among the larger companies that i mean that we have some international companies that still are um are, are still not there and then we just show them well look what you're doing in singapore or look what you the the integration you're doing and um you know, in um, the UK and in, in Europe, and uh, and they'll be surprised that the you know the headquarters in California has no idea that this level of integration already has examples in their own buildings. Right. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Thank you. And, and obviously, that the again going back to the passive uh, stuff and the envelope, they, they make buildings in a way smarter, not in the information technology sense but they do make building smarter so if that's what our aspirations are that, that's great thank you very much scott for your thank questions. you i appreciate it um so um well uh, i think we're in nearly wrapping up so maybe we can just have a chit chat about what, what's just happened here and we, we we did try a new format here and and uh, we did get some uh, some um, new interesting subjects thoughts group one thing that kind of strikes me here that goes on consistently really is that when we're talking about the customer, you know, the guy at the end, um, usually it's about one guy in a complete organization because the rest of the organization are going off their lawyers or bankers or their manufacturing stuff. It's nothing to do with what they're doing. It, but yes, the environment they're living in, but there's usually one guy, you know, that's there or it's the FM company. You know, and so trying to reach this, you know, the customer tends to be this person, which is, you know, how does he get educated and what does he do it is, is the real challenge of finding, it, you know, and I, I, it does worry me that probably not enough people who are, you know, look, uh, looking after these buildings are, are really taking ownership of, of what they should be doing. You know, like, like the guys have been coming on saying, well, how do we get the information to them? You know, as I say, it's usually about one person, even in a large organization, uh, that, that, that is somewhere way down the chain in importance because he's not a banker or is is not the main fundamental part of the, the business. Yeah, I think just to echo Roger's point, what, what I'm getting out of the session again is education, right? It's still, unless Scott was just saying, education is still a huge part. I mean, yeah, even I just got an email just, 10 seconds ago from someone who I thought would have been all over and understood, you know, Haystack and was still expressing surprise in, you know, what he did and didn't know um, in that equation. And, and I think education is still a big part of, of what we need to do. And that's clear. And then to, to Roger's point, getting to the right guy. I find the same thing, Roger, that you, know, you start talking to, you know, a, a customer or some opportunity or whatever else. And then usually the way it gets described to me is it says, well, okay, this is all great, but you've got to go speak to Joe. And if Joe says it's okay, then we're good to go, right? And <laughs> that's when you finally work out who Joe is and what he plays in the equation. Yeah, I think Joe, communication... Joe may not actually be a, a senior level person, right? It could be anywhere. He's a, he's a gatekeeper. Yeah, he's more of a gatekeeper than a decision maker, right? I mean, he can say no, and if, it's a, if, if he says no, you're, you're dead in the water, but um, yeah, sorry, Ken. I think the communication piece is a, is a big piece of this because 
the education is driven once you know that you don't know something. <laughs> and I think with the communication, the, the problem with communication is the perception that we have communicated. And we the trouble is, is when we say a bunch of words, we're all coming from different backgrounds, different thoughts. And I think what you just said means this. And I always default it to mean something so that I understand. And for the things I don't understand, I don't ask enough questions to, to make that communication clear that I don't understand. And now I need to be educated. So I think there's a bunch of that going on as well. And I'm trying to figure out how to make that better. And I'm thinking that somehow the industry has to give information, but we have to get rid of those ads because the ads are so annoying uh, that people won't read stuff. But if they actually give some of their thoughts and some of their, the part of the start of their education and uh, a link to resources, that could be useful. So I'm trying to figure out the best way of doing that. That's what, that's where our heads are right now. Mm. I, I heard can't... a new acronym just yesterday, uh, Ken, uh, uh, TLDR, too long I didn't read. <laughs> yeah. But Ken, I got to say, here you are again with just a couple of minutes ago talking about, you know, what, what might be an industry problem, but it's a problem with humanity in general, listening, communication and all that. So you, you're always spot on, Matt. So there's, a, there's the wisdom from Ken for today. Any other thoughts as we start to wrap up? Okay. Two years on the book, let's turn the page. Let's keep going. Yeah, yeah move forward. Yeah, yeah. With, the, with the bigger guys getting involved in the industry, maybe they can set, you know, some of the other companies will start looking at them as they, you know, as examples to what they're doing with their buildings and start thinking, hey, we, you know, we should be doing this too. I don't know, but, you know, one would hope that, that you know, someone is setting an example out there and they may be big enough for people to sit up and take a look at what's going on in their buildings. Mm. Can, can I think the technical term for what you're describing is uh, thought leadership is kind of when you talk about stuff rather than commercial in away from the uh, advertising commercial context. That's uh, I think that's what I try and can actually ex um, uncover gaps in communication so that you can then start to educate and start to bridge those gaps. So if you go this whole communication issue you know when i look at monday live and, and you know we're asking ourselves what do we want to do what do we need to be doing going forward so in this last year we've hit you know we've put a lot of energy and in, in, into the smarter stack we see people starting to adopt it using it actively so we hit on something very positive now we're taking a next step to try to write specifications that help define the, the number one problem with getting to smarter, which is interoperability. But one of the things the smarter stack does by, by using it, it automatically defines certain functional uh, categories of information or capabilities that if Monday Live and so, or some version of Monday Live were able to um, capture the information and be a data resource um, essentially a data lake for, uh, for all things smart. Um, it, you, you, could see, you could see us building a, a very extensive library of, of information uh, as people, in other words, create a smarter stack, submit your uh, links to what, you, what it is you have in your smarter stack and, and, and then some way to co uh, collate all the information in common uh, categories. Um, just a thought for us to keep talking about as we go forward. Okay, that's exactly the kind of thinking I'm having. The other thing that I see that has happened with Monday Live and, and pandemic driven has been the fact that we, we all basically generate our own information. And uh, certainly as a, as a publication, every, everybody who is involved with our site does a better job of generating uh, publication than we do. But what we really need to do is we need to give them these, the equivalent of these windows that they can tell their story and we can quickly share all of that. I'm trying to figure out the best way to do that. And we've got, I've got some folks on it now and uh, we'll, 
we'll, we'll report back to you. But I think that is, you get, to, you get to present your own information. The stack is probably a part of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, we, we get to share it and we try and keep the commercialism out of it. Right. And that would be a quite a useful informational site. Yeah, um, Steve Jones just posted that uh, considering making Smarter Stack a standard part of their future case studies, I think that's a, a, a great comment. And with that, I think we need to wrap this show up. It's been really great. Uh, thank you, Scott, uh, David, and Steve for your contribution. And thanks uh, everybody else also for being here. And uh, video uh, will be on YouTube by tomorrow morning and we'll see you next week on Monday Live. In the meantime, have a great week, everybody. Well, John, I'll see you later. Bye. 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 Bye.